it blows my mind that people get this so wrong. So there's no images, there's no logos. It doesn't feel like a newsletter. Now, I'm always gonna try to change what, what I'm talking about ever so slightly. Red here will represent our subject line, okay? That's the first thing that's going to be capturing the attention of someone. When we email our list, that's of course uh, the first thing that they're gonna see, okay? And then if they even open that email, then within that, We've got perhaps introductory bit of text, a little bit of text here. Then we've got uh, a link, a bit more text, maybe another link, a bit more text, and then perhaps a sign off, okay? It's a typical arrangement of an email. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know what an email looks like. That doesn't even do it justice. We have to understand firstly, the big picture of what an email and all of the elements in it is designed to do. Because it blows my mind that people get this so wrong. So firstly, subject line. The subject line's job and sole responsibility is to get the open. That's it. There's nothing else that the subject line is really doing, okay? It, the email afterward picks up on what the subject line has started doing. That's all it's designed to do. So we think about subject lines, we're just trying to get the ready open. We've got to get creative with how we do it. We've got to mix it up so we're giving them different things. But that's ultimately what we're trying to do is get the flip and click. When they click, okay, they come into the email. I typically, and I wanna just make this really clear on record, I'm not saying I have the best system for how these emails should look and feel, but this is what I do and I find it works just fine for me. I write my emails in a very simple format. So there's no images, there's no logos. It doesn't feel like a newsletter. You can of course do that. I mentioned in the in the introduction to this that your list will get used to you. They'll get used to your style and what you, you typically send them. So pick a style and run with it and you're probably gonna have to stick to it. Um, this is just what I've stuck to. My list are used to this, it works great. It, it all started because 10 years ago, Frank Kern taught that you should write an email and make it feel like an actual email going from one person to another. And since then I did it, it's worked and I haven't really looked back. So if you're following my framework, then I'm gonna Start the email by talking to that person. Hey, Phil, I'm also gonna add in a little bit of code that adds his name. I typically will start with, hey, first name, I just wanna make it personal. I wanna make sure they, they feel like this is a personal email. Then we've got the first chunk of text. First chunk of text before the first opportunity they have to click. This first chunk of text has a very, very important job, okay? you don't necessarily need to be writing an email from top to bottom. I write it in sections. The first section, the job is twofold. Number one, to carry on the conversation that the subject line started. That's the first thing. You don't want your email openers to feel cheated into the open, okay? Maybe you've clicked on a YouTube video in the past and the title sounded so intriguing. You're like, I've just got to click on this. And then the video starts there's no reference to the thing that was in the thumbnail or the title. You kind of feel a bit cheated and you're almost not paying your full attention until that open loop, it gets closed. You're like, yeah, I'm not even really listening. Just, just go back to the thing about the camel and the banana. I just need to know what that was all about. And you won't pay attention to anything else until they do. Or you get to the end of the video and you're like, well, I don't like this brand now. I don't like this guy. Yes, I consumed his video, but I just don't really, like he didn't deliver on what he said. So the subject, like this first section has got to carry on the conversation of the subject line. Otherwise they'll feel cheated. So that, that's the first role of that chunk. The second role is your first opportunity to get the click here, okay? It's the first opportunity to get the click. A lot of your people on your list won't need to read a whole email. They just will read the first little bit and they'll just decide, do I want to click or not, right? They're not necessarily going to scroll all the way down, even though these emails won't actually be very long. And so you just need to go in with something really intriguing, really exciting, tell them what it's all about and get the click. I'm not a fan of emails, and I'll have to do this all in, in one color now, but I'm not a fan of emails that look like this. I, I'm really not a fan of that. Every now and again, we're talking like once a quarter, I might experiment with a longer email and just see if that 
creates a more informed click or whatever the case may be. But to make someone read all of that and wait that long just to click, I haven't seen any evidence that that has people coming over to the page with extra enthusiasm to buy the thing or to register for the thing, whatever the case may be. Nothing we've ever tracked has really demonstrated that, but you do lose clicks because not everyone's going to scroll the way down and make the click. Most people, if the subject line grabbed their attention, you've probably seen it with my stuff and other people that you follow. If you get an email from me, if the subject line got your attention, you're probably going to click too. You're just going to go, yeah, like I like John, that one got me. What was this one about today? And you'll just click the link. As long as nothing in here really t turned you off, you know? So we'll start the email with a little paragraph bro broken up perhaps into two or three very, very short sections of text. And then it's all, it's all designed to get that first click. Now to get this first click, we want to use hyperlinks as you're all, I'm sure familiar with, you all know what a hyperlink is, right? Yeah. But when you're, when you're doing, um, the instruction in, in, in the hyperlink, I have for the longest time, and it's just always worked. So I've never changed it. I will just make it very clear what they need to do. I will literally say things like click here to do this or, um, take action now. I tell them what to do in that hyperlink text and it's always, always worked great. And it actually does get a higher click through rate in our testing than something else that's, I don't know, a bit, maybe more descriptive. If I was talking about our meta masterclass, for example, and it just said link, link to course, right? That was what the text said. Like that would not beat me saying access the course here, click here now to join the Meta Masterclass. Like instructing them, telling them what to do next, it, it does actually work. So that's the type of hyperlink that we would use. Now here's where it gets really interesting. We've got this next block of text, okay? This section in here, this is our second chance at getting the click. I want you to think about what's happening in the mind of the, of the, uh, the prospect at this point. If they are reading from top to bottom, which we know that they most likely are, except for the people that are just ra you know, rapidly scrolling up and down to find something interesting. Most people are going to read from top to bottom. If they read and didn't click, if we continue the email talking about exactly the same thing and not changing the angle in any way, that's not really going to help us get the click the second time. I want you to think about this click as another opportunity to get the click. So we've got to get creative and change the tact here a little bit. So I always think about this when I'm writing emails. As I'm writing it, I'm coming up with something interesting for the first bit, first hyperlink. Now, I'm always going to try to change what, what I'm talking about ever so slightly. Maybe this was an introduction to a new webinar. If I didn't get the click, in the second bit, I might give the details of what I'm actually going to cover in that webinar. If that didn't get the click, the final um, chunk of text might have some urgency. You see what I'm saying? Like every part of the email is another chance to get the click. The longer the email goes, it's another thing for your notes. The longer the email goes, the more uh, opportunities I put to click. You kind of want to think about it as, um, do you, do you know what above the fold means? Yeah. So think about your emails in the same way above the fold, everything that's visible before someone would have to scroll. At any point while they're scrolling your email, if you were to just randomly pause, scroll, scroll, pause, is there a visible opportunity to click? If you ever wrote an email and they were scrolling and they could pause at a moment in their email client and there's no visible opportunity to click, mistake. So that's kind of just a, a helpful way to remember it. There just needs to be nice opportunities to click, but spaced out to where Yes, we want it to be within the fold at all times, but it doesn't need to be after every sentence. You with me? Like that would just be excessive. And uh, and then and then finally we have the sign off. All right. I always again this is just a personal email, so I'll always sign it off. You may want to pull a Frank Kern and have a <laughs> whoops have a have a PS line. I do sometimes. I used to teach that PS lines were quite good, and I um, just don't really use them anymore. No rhyme or reason, so you could have a PS. It's a nice opportunity to add something else that almost feels like a little tag on. Um, I sometimes use them, I, I usually don't. So that's the, really the makeup of the email. And so I want you to be thinking about the fact that on the way down, every part of the email is playing its part to get someone to move through. It's not just an email. 
did the email perform or did it not? Every part of it had a, had a part to play. A couple of tips on the actual writing of this, of this email, okay? When you're putting an email together like this, the content itself must be as bite-sized as possible. If you start writing big, long paragraphs of text, you're going to lose people. There won't be a nice, natural moment to have a call to action even. So it's got to be bite-sized. It's got to, and I'll show, again, you're going to see some examples as we go through today. So it's going to be a sentence and then a break, a paragraph break, and then a small paragraph and a paragraph break. Sometimes it will be a paragraph of text and then the next line is just three words with a, I always forget what it's called, dot, 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 three dots. We'll call it the, the three dots. Well, you have the three dots, which naturally leads you to the next paragraph. But by having that in there, it creates more white space. So you actually want lots of white space as you read because they, they will actually follow all the way down. Whereas you could have the same amount of text just bunched up and they won't read it. So you've got to make sure you keep it, you keep it bite size. And then a uh, couple of quick tips, I suppose. I've got two sneakier styles of emails that I sometimes use. Uh, you can't overuse these because if you overuse them, they'll lose their effectiveness. But if you use these periodically, they're actually, um, they're actually pretty cool. So the first one is, is, I mean, lack of a better phrase, the sneaky personal email, okay? And the sneaky personal email is where you write an email to your entire list, but you really work hard to make it sound like it's, a, it's an email going out to just one person. So you start the email, you know, hey, name, a very brief message, like you were genuinely emailing a friend, just a, a quick reminder or an invitation to something. So I might say, you know, uh, hey, James, uh, I didn't see you on the list for our upcoming web class. I'm going to be touching on this. I thought you'd be interested. And then um, I might put, here's the link. And I actually put the link address. I don't hyperlink. I actually put adclients.com forward slash new class or something like that. I actually put the link and then hyperlink the link. If you, if you just put a clickable link in an email, you've got to have HTTPS colon slash slash. So I can get rid of all of that by just typing out and it won't be a clickable link, but typing out ad client, it starts with a adclients.com forward slash new class, much nicer, cleaner link. And then I hyperlink that text with the actual longer, more uglier link. Yep. So I'll put that in there. Then I'll just say, let me know if you can make it, sign off. And then I push down the unsubscribe button as much as I can. Enter, 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 enter. And I create all these paragraph breaks all the way down to the bottom of the email. So the text is only this, but the actual email is this because it's a total empty white space. What that does is when someone opens that email in their inbox, they get to the bottom of the email and they don't see an unsubscribe. And they think, oh, this actually was a genuinely personal email to me. This is great. So, and it, so it does, it really does work because they'd have to scroll for a long time to even figure that out. Most people won't. So that does really, really good. That also has another benefit because if you uh, include um, a call to action in here to reply back to you, that works super good too. Because if Matt got the email and I said, hey, Matt, you come into, are you coming to our web class? It's happening tomorrow. I didn't see you on the list. Um, you know, let, uh, here's, here's the link to register. Um, just reply back to this email. Let me know if you're coming. Enter, 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 enter. Okay, it feels really personal. He's going to click and register. I might increase my chances of a reply. Does anyone know why we would want a reply to an email? Correct. Yeah. So if you can start to get people replying to your emails, their email client will mark you as a safe contact because this person has clearly replied. They clearly want to be hearing from you. So you have a much better chance at landing in their in inbox next time and a much better chance at landing in anyone's inbox because the more you grow your reputation, the more email clients mark you as safe, the more over the, overall you're, you, you look as a, like a really good email sender. And so your open rate goes up uh, overall. Furthermore, there's a second benefit. If they reply, now you've got a one-to-one -one lead that if you have a team of people that they can dive into. If you've got VAs that are starting conversations already on social media, they, they continue conversations from email replies. And so if you've got setters, people that are starting conversations on the phone, your setters can dive into those people and reply back to them and say, awesome, looking forward to having you uh, on, on the workshop, continue the conversation, get them on the phone. So it's another way into a one-to-one -one, um, conversation as well. All right. So that's the first um, 
sneaky email. Uh, there's another one that I quite like, and it's this. So we have we have the email uh, we have the email content, and then as a part of the email, where we have oh actually it would be it would be green. But I'll have click, 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 and then a bit more copy, and then and then a sign off. I've got three links right on top of each other, smaller ones. This is called the fake quiz. And the fake quiz is you ask your audience a question and they can respond by letting you know which category they fall into or what they most need help with right now or what an answer to a question is. You can get creative with what the quiz is, all right? And each one of these is a hyperlink that sends them off somewhere. Whichever one they click on, they go to the same place. So if you're just taking them off to a sales page or a webinar registration or whatever the case may be, you can get creative about what the quiz can be and there's three options. Naturally, human psychology, if you opened an email from someone that you like, that you often engage with, if there's a question, you kind of want to answer it. And you kind of want to, oh, am I going to get this question right? Or, um, you know, yeah, I want I just, I, it's, it's engaging, it's different. I think it really lends itself to what I was saying about you've got to mix it up with your list. Do different stuff, keep them engaged, keep them on their feet. It's something else to send them, but they all go to the same place anyway. I originally learned that from Perry Belcher, really, really smart guy. Um, so, so that, uh, that's the other one, the fake quiz. You know, don't overuse it, but every now and again, drop it in. That works quite well. <laughs>